We have everybody in the house of the Lord this morning, and uh, so let's all stand. Let's have a word of prayer as we begin Sunday school. Of course, Pastor Josh is not here. He's been teaching the last few weeks on Exodus, and uh, he's not here today, so it's on me. You have to listen to me today. I'm sorry about that. Yeah, but um, I'm going to continue on his lesson, so... Um, one thing that we do know, uh, obviously, I'm better looking than him. So at least you got that going for you, right? I didn't get a single amen out of that one. So, <laughs> amen. Oh, let's pray together in Jesus' name. Lord, we love you this morning. We're thankful for your love and your mercy and your grace. Thank you, God, for your blessings and your goodness. God, we just, when we think back of where you brought us from, when we think back, God, of how you brought us out of a sinful life. God, you you let us out and gave us freedom and liberty. Lord, today we just rejoice in that. We say thank you. We ask you, God, to anoint this time together today as we learn. Let us grow in our relationship with you. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. God bless you. You can be seated. Uh, Pastor Josh has been teaching on the book of Exodus, and uh, he has such a, a great unique way of teaching things, and some of the stuff he gets out of that, out of it, I'm like, you know, th- those are the people you just love to hate, you know? You ever see somebody that can play any instrument? You just hate them. You love them, but you hate them at the same time, or they can, they're talented, or, you know, I'm like, I hate you. <clears throat> no, but, um, so, we're gonna, uh, he's on vacation. I, I don't know why they need to be on vacation, but they are, but, um, and then they went south to Savannah where it's hot and sticky. So let's, um, it's hot down there. So let's pray for them that they get here safely, get home safely. They had a great time. I know the young people miss him very much. So, all right, to the book of Exodus, uh, just in review for over the last few weeks, I've not been in here when he was teaching, so I really don't know exactly what all, but I do know that <clears throat> he always mentions that the Old Testament is the New Testament. Does anybody know what he's concealed? And the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. So we need to always remember that. And that when we're studying the Old Testament, it's generally it's always got something to say about the future. And it applies to us today. It parallels the New Testament. It's, uh, the Old Testament has types and shadows of the New Testament. <clears throat> in the physical, we're in the spiritual. But everything in the Old Testament points the way to Jesus Christ. We know that. So our eyes are on Jesus, or should be. You can always find him throughout the scriptures, uh, beginning in the Old Testament. And this, the ex- book of Exodus is probably one of the most, uh, one of the books that were probably the most, uh, book, book that has him in it the most. It's, it's never more apparent than in the book of Exodus. So today we're going to be studying the three signs, or, or three signs, not the three, but three signs of God's grace that we see in the opening of the book of Exodus, and how they work in our lives today. So, <clears throat> symbolic of, of slavery and sin and that we live in today. And of course, everybody in Egypt was once all the Israel Jews that are in Egypt were born there, and that were born there were born slaves. They were not born free people. And so they were born slaves. Just like we today, we're born, we're born into the slavery of sin. And just like the Hebrews were in bondage to Egypt, we're in bondage to sin. And it's, uh, we have a choice. They will, uh, you know, they, cute little babies, they're, they're born cute and innocent, but they're not. We're all sinners when we're born. And But God... Through in the book of Exodus, we see how he led his people out of Egypt uh, to the Red Sea. He didn't take them straight to the promised land. Of course, this is just review, but he, he took them on a journey. He took them on a detour. Uh, why? Why was that? Because he was preparing them for the promise that he had for them. And so they had, they had, even though they were out of Egypt, they still had not discarded their old mindset of slavery. In their minds, you know, you could come out, but they're, they're still, they had that mindset of slavery. Yet, uh, so God took them on this journey through the wilderness so they could learn uh, the best 
discipline of having faith in him. They could learn the discipline of, of freedom, if you want to call it that, and liberty. And so because, uh, <clears throat> leaving Egypt behind is symbolic of what? Repentance. Right? Most of us know that. Again, he's talked about this over the last few weeks. But when we leaving Egypt behind in the Old Testament was symbolic of our repentance in the New Testament. Repentance means turn around. It means about face. It means going the other direction. So no longer am I going to live in Egypt. I'm going to walk out of Egypt and I'm going to live or I'm going to pursue the promise of promises of God or the promised land. So it symbolizes for us repentance of our sin. So just like the people of Israel left Egypt behind, we're called to leave behind our old lives of slavery to our sin nature. We're called to just walk away from that and now make godly choices, make new choices. Uh, just like they were born as slaves, again, we're born as slaves to the sin nature of humanity. Uh, we, When we repent, we are partaking in a spiritual exodus. Everybody say a spiritual exodus. When you repent of your sins, you are literally making the choice to leave Egypt or leave sin. We've decided to, just like they did, to obey God. And not, it's not just a form, but it's an actual an act of obedience. And we leave our old life, our old place of slavery, and we pursue the promises of God for our life or Again, the promised land. So the Hebrews didn't just leave Egypt behind. They did something significant. They crossed the Red Sea. Now, this is significant. Uh, it's symbolic of baptism. I, we had a wonderful opportunity yesterday to baptize uh, Caleb Luther. And he was at my house doing a little work for me. And uh, he and Xavier, and they, I guess they got to talk, and they came and knocked on the door, and he's been praying about it. And... Uh, studying it and talking to his parents about it. So we took him down to the creek behind the house and baptized him in Jesus' name in the creek. Amen. And we had a big old spider about this big watching us from the tree. So didn't have any problem with the girls getting close to that. But so uh, but the, uh, I, I was talking to Caleb, and I told him, I said, the, here's the deal. When you leave, when we repent of our sins, when Egypt, uh, when Israel left Egypt, they didn't, the, of course, we know that the, the, the Israel, or the, I can't even talk this morning, the Egyptians pursued them, and God protected them and gave them the opportunity to get away through the pillar of the fire. He put a cloud there and fire there uh, to protect, keep the, something between them, protect them until they got to the Red Sea, okay? His spirit was there protecting them until they got to the Red Sea. He gave them that opportunity, okay? Then... They made the choice. They walked through on dry ground. Okay, that was a supernatural event. Now, they're still slaves up until that point. But once they crossed the Red Sea, the water came down, washed away all the Egyptians, you know, toppled their, their uh, chariots, washed them away, and now they are totally free. For the first, had no choice. They were slaves. They would always be pursued by their, their past. They'll always be pursued by their owners, okay? But now there's a supernatural separation from, between them and their owners. Now they, could, they are truly free people. They're liberated, and now there's something different. They, from that point on, the choice was their own. When we make the choice to repent of our sins, Okay, we still own those sins. We still belong to those sins. They own us. The sin nature owns us. Satan literally owns us. And even after we repent, I'm sorry, God. But when we go down in the water, there's a supernatural event that happens in the spirit realm. Blood is truly liberated from our past. You're liberated from your bad choices, your bad mistakes, the sin nature, your birth, of, uh, the birth being born, I'll get it out in a minute, in sin, you're free from that. Now you are a free agent to make your own choices. But once we come out of that water, now I have to make my own choice. Now I choose to look back toward Egypt and wish I was back there. I said amen. <clears throat> the separation from the enemy's authority and power over them was supernaturally severed by God himself. It wasn't something they could do. It's something that only God could do. And until they crossed the Red Sea, uh, they, again, 
they were they they were under their the power of sin or Egypt, but God supernaturally severed that by dividing the Red Sea. When um, now it's their choice. Today we're going to study what happens after that. So we repent of our sins. They came out of Egypt. They crossed the Red Sea, symbolic of baptism. But today we're going to study what happens after. We're going to pick up in Exodus chapter 15, and uh, where the Israelites are rejoicing. They're excited. They've just experienced this great victory. How many of you remember when you got the Holy Ghost and you got baptized? Amen. The joy that you, when you first were baptized in Jesus' name. <clears throat> I talk to a lot of people in um, when they're baptized, and they say they feel, they can tell. When they come up out of that water, in the name of Jesus, they feel the supernatural power of God. Because it is, it's a supernatural event. So let's look at Exodus chapter 15, starting in verse 1. It says, Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord, and spake, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will prepare him in habitation. My Father is God, and I will exalt him. Uh, the Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his host hath he cast into the sea. He's chosen captains. His chosen captains are also drowned in the sea. The depths have covered them. They sank into the bottom as a stone. Thy right hand, O Lord, has become glorious in power. Thy right hand, O Lord, hath dashed in pieces the enemy. And the greatness of thine excellency, thou hast overthrown them that rose up, that rose up against thee, thou... Thou sentest forth, thou sentest forth thy wrath, which consumed them as stubble. And with the blast of thy nostrils, the waters were gathered together. The floods, the floods stood upright as a heap, and the depths were congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy said, "I will pursue. I will overtake. I will divide the spoil. My lust shall be satisfied upon them. I will draw my sword. My hand shall destroy them." But then he says, Thou didst blow with thy wind. The sea covered them. They sank as lead in the mighty water. It sounds like they're having, it sounds like somebody that just got the Holy Ghost and someone just was baptized and they're rejoicing that they, man, I'm free. God has changed my life. And haven't you heard somebody just give their testimony? How God has just really changed it. You're looking around today, look around at the miracles in this room. Some of us were slaves in, uh, to sin and we came out of that. So we know what they're talking about here. So they're rejoicing. They're having a party. Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? Thou stretchest out thy right hand. The earth swallowed them. Thou in thy mercy hast uh, led forth the people which thou hast redeemed. Thou hast uh, guided them in thy strength into the holy habitation. And so anybody... We all left church services where the Spirit of God was so powerful that we just felt like we could conquer the world. We've all been there. Where we just, man, God just really touched us, and, and we feel like, man, I've, I've got this. this. We have the zeal. <clears throat> you feel like celebrating, and uh, uh, then Monday morning comes. <clears throat> Anybody but me, you ever want to quit every Monday? Amen. So you just throw in the towel. Uh, Something, it never fails when you come off of a high, we'll call it a high, a spiritual uh, victory, that uh, something seems like it always happens to distract us from the blessing. Monday morning, you know, whatever, car blows up or you have a flat tire or something horrible happens that distracts us from the blessing. So here the children of Israel are marching along. Uh, and remember, they're in the desert, they're, they're in the wilderness. But so they just had this huge celebration and rejoicing and oh God is wonderful, God is awesome, and look what he did, and God did this, God did that, na 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 na, y'all not pursuing us anymore, God showed you. And so so and they're marching along in this wilderness. Let's look at verse twenty two. So Moses uh, brought Israel from the Red Sea and they went out into the wilderness of Shur, and they went three days. So we're three days in here and found no water. So crisis number one. And when they came to Mara, they could not drink of the waters of Mara, for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Mara. And the people 
murmured against Moses, saying, what shall we drink? So three days in, we're celebrating, we're excited. Man, we see the awesome power of God. We know what God's power can do. Man, we saw it. And just three days in, they start murmuring and complaining. <laughs> what do you do? They got, and then so they come to this place where there is water, but it's bitter, it's undrinkable. And so their situation, obviously we can understand, they're thirsty. I mean, three days without any water, uh, or at least they've run out of water. But um, they're, in this, they're, dead, they're in a desert, they're thirsty, what do they do? But they be, so immediately they begin to murmur, which is a sin. They sin. The Bible says they grumbled to Moses. Their situation obviously was tense and, 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 and tough, but they reacted sinfully because now, what, what is it? Now they have a choice. They're God's people now. They're free people now. They've seen God act. They've seen God, what God, so God can part the Red Sea, but he can't give me a drink of water? Hello? We have to, part of the journey in our walk with God is learning to trust God. Learning to allow God to teach us. Learning to allow God to discipline us. Discipline us. The, word, the, uh, dis, the um, root word for discipline is disciple. I think. Is that right? Or maybe the other way around. But they both got the same thing in them. Disciple, discipline. And so uh, the, the, the thing is we have this mindset too many times that we, we just... Well, man, we're free. We just want to let the miracles come. Let the blessings flow, Lord. And uh, we get used to cup, cupcakes and candy, and then we don't want to eat our dinner. Is that a good analogy right there? We want the blessings of God. And we live in a culture, in a church culture, folks, where it's all about the blessings. Oh, Make me feel good. And there's wonderful programs. Uh, but we beca and so this church culture has become spoiled and not disciplined. So here we find the children of Israel coming out of Exodus, I mean out of Egypt on their Exodus. Uh, and they're, they're, although they're slaves, man, they've, they've had, they're beaten every day. And all, but they had food, they had water, as little as it was. But... Three days in, they're forgetting how bad it was in Egypt. And they're murmuring and they're complaining. They start immediately sinning in their attitude toward Moses, number one, toward God. So finally, again, um, they begin to grumble. And so they reacted sinfully. Be careful. When you're in, your, in our walk with God, we must be careful that we, our situation doesn't cause us to sin. It's easy. It happens. In our attitude, we start mumbling, we start complaining, we start, you know, uh, fussing a little bit. We get so caught up in the desert situation that we're in that we forget the miracle of the Red Sea. That's why I, I tell us many times here, I said, when I, to th we need to think back of what God has done in our life. Get our focus off our situation right now. Because God, in many cases, God is trying to discipline us. He's trying to help us to, grow, to, to make us stronger. My, uh, I was, those boys were working yesterday, and, and, uh, and I'm thinking, that's good, Xavier. I'm, trying to, I'm making him do some work. And he's like, Ugh. I said, your skinny little arms will thank me in a few years, you know, because we're, you're learning some disciplines that'll keep you, that'll work for you later on in life. And so we get caught up, if we're not careful, we get so caught up in the tribulation that we forget the previous blessings. We need to always remember what God did for me yesterday. I need to look back. There's that little song that says, when I, when I look back over my life, I can't remember the rest of the words, but when I look back over my life and I think things over, I can truly say I've been blessed. So we need to always look back at the, and remember the blessings and the miracles and the times of rejoicing. We forget those very quickly. We forget those. So, um, but again, I was talking about the culture of the church. We, we're, very, we are, we're a spoiled people, and we don't want discipline. So 
We don't want to be disciplined. We just want the cupcakes and the, and the cookies and the soda pop all the time. And we don't have a party all the time. God says, no, sometimes you got to eat some oatmeal. And sometimes you need to eat, you need to eat your vegetables. Amen. Because they make you strong. They make you healthy. So here's God. Three days in, he's trying to teach them. It's a long, you're going to spend a long time here. You need to get used to the desert. So anyway, we need to look at the blessings. Galatians 6, 9. I've got to keep going here. Galatians chapter 6, verse 9 says, Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. I'm going to tell you something. Living for God is not always easy. The journey, let me say this, the journey to the promises of God is not an easy journey. And I know that's the, 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 uh, the mantra of the day is happy, clappy, and bless, you know, Blessings and, and honor and favor of God and, and, and a lot of churches, that's all you'll hear is how the blessings of the Lord and how God's just a sugar daddy. And, uh, but that's not the case. In my, it's not in my life, and I've been living for God for a long time, and I've not found it's been good. It's a good journey. It's a blessed journey because I focus on the blessings, but there's, there's, some, there's some times when I get weary. There's some times when I get frustrated. Amen. 9.30 this morning when we didn't have many people here at prayer, my flesh got frustrated. I had to come over here and repent and say, God, you're going to have to help my attitude. Okay? And so um, just throw that out there for anybody that wasn't here at 9.30 for prayer. We do start church at 9.30 on Sunday mornings. Can I pastor for a second? Is that all right? You're not late for work, are you? Are you on time for work? Be on time for church. This is a lot more important than, than work. Hello? Uh, you may not agree, so this is some of this desert stuff right here. Okay? All right? Church is a lot more important than your job. Again, it's up, it's up here. We don't, we, don't, we don't think about that. We say, oh, well, you know, God understands. And he does. He does. But he also expects us to. To be faithful. Anyway, okay. Get that off my chest. Now I can just, I can teach. <laughs> but we must be careful not to let our situation cause us to sin. So here's the, they're coming out of Egypt and uh, 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 three days in and they begin to murmur and complain because their situation is not what they want it to be. So they grumble, they complain, and then the Bible says they want to stone Moses. And it's not his fault. He's just doing what God says. Hey, they want to fire the preacher three days into the church. And so, you know, and so, uh, so they grumble and complain. And, and, and of course, he, he was used to that because he had some of that in Egypt. We see, so we see great, the great mercy of God, though, in how, he, how God responds to the Israelites. How would you respond? Uh, Pastor Hogue, how would you respond? Amen. If the saints and kings started mumbling and complaining, man, your flesh rises up, you just want to... Uh, you want to do, you know, he's, just, he's, he's better than me. He'll just love on them. And he's patient and kind and graceful and merciful. I'm not that way. Yeah. yeah I, I, I know you would. I know you would. But notice that God doesn't condemn them for murmuring and complaining. Right? He didn't, doesn't condemn them. He doesn't strike them down with, with snakes or sickness or lightning bolts. Um, instead, he provides them a solution. Again, this is, this is the grace of God. The Bible says the Lord showed them a tree, showed uh, Moses a tree in Exodus 15, 24, and he threw it into the bitter waters, and the bitter waters became sweet. Now remember, everything in the Exodus is significant. So it's a picture of something to come. So again, we're talking about this morning, the, the three, uh, what's the title? Three, I lost, three signs of God's grace. <laughs> Uh, so just like there's a tree in Exodus that made bitter water sweet, so too today there's a tree available to those who have left Egypt behind. It's the cross. The tree in Exodus, the, the branch, the, the tree he threw in the water, symbolizes the cross of Calvary. Uh, the cross is what makes the bitter waters of life sweet. The cool thing about us as Holy Ghost-filled people that have uh, come out of sin and been delivered, we know the power of the cross. We know the, 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 the blessings of the cross. Uh, the scripture, in a lot of scriptures, it calls that cross a tree. Acts 5, 29, 
It says, Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you slew and hanged on a tree. Why a tree? This is some of the stuff. This is Pastor Josh's notes. So uh, I just revamped them. I, I, I never saw this. But why a tree? Uh, as we, if we look back in Genesis chapter C, we see that death entered into the world by a tree. It was a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so now life is coming through a tree. Uh, this tree in Exodus is a shadow of this moment of Calvary when the cross would make the bitter waters of our life sweet. Amen. The good thing about the cross is it goes back to what I just said is, you know, there's times in our life when we want to murmur, we want to complain how hard it is, oh, how bad my life is, oh, this is going on, why this, why that. Those are the bitter moments. But in the bitter moments, you can always, God always gives you a solution. You can always go to the cross. You can always go to the cross. When I look back at the cross, when I take time to stare and focus on the cross and what happened for my life at the cross, I can get gets my mind and my focus off my current situation that's causing me to have a bad attitude and a bad bad spirit or and possibly sin. It gets my mind and my focus off of that, and it gets back on what God did for me at Calvary. Isn't it wonderful to think about where God brought you from? Brother Eric, you got some bad situations in your life. You deal with some cry from. That's another song. Won't be this way forever. Uh, I no longer have to fear death. I never, no longer have to fear the grave or what comes after that. I have peace in Jesus through his death on that tree. In the situation that we're going through right now, the world's freaking out. Everybody's afraid of everything. It's, there's division. There's all kind of stuff. I, we don't have to be afraid of that. We can have perfect peace in what happened at Calvary. Now, here's what I just want to share this little thought with you. If you have, and if you're freaking out about all this stuff, is if Jesus Christ can save your soul, He can keep you through this stuff. He didn't save you to let you down. Amen. Well, he did it at the cross, took care of all of it. So we can have perfect peace through his death on Calvary. And, and the other benefit is we know that the ground is level at the foot of the cross. No good people, no bad people. It's all the same. Uh, there's only one thing there, only one distinguisher, sinner and forgiven. There's only two types of people at the, at, at the cross, those that are sinners and those that are already forgiven. Doesn't matter how much money you've got. Doesn't matter how much, what your name is, what color you are. It's all the same with Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, and that knowledge gives us peace. Um, and so the, the love that we experience at that tree of Calvary makes the bitterness of life very sweet. I want to challenge you this morning. If you're struggling uh, with bitterness or unforgiveness or hurt or fear, anxiety, uh, uncertainty, go visit Calvary. Go spend some time at the foot of the cross and uh, consider what was done for you there. You know, I've been praying before in here and just going through situations and, and I just, I find myself over here. And I know this is just a, a, a symbol, but I find myself, Brother Barry, over here and I just put my hand on that cross and I begin to think about what God did for me. It's all taken care of right there. Everything. Every problem, every crisis, every hurt, every pain, everything I've ever faced in my life or will face in my life is, is, is handled right there. But I have to remember that. I have to remember where Jesus brought me from and where he's taking me to, and that's what's going to make the difference. Uh, so consider what God's done for you at the cross. If you're going through something, consider your life without it. Here's what some of us need to do. We need to consider what my life would look like without Jesus Christ. We begin to get thirsty. They we, and we 
Fast forward a little bit here. I'm getting ahead of myself. But they begin to say, we had it better there. You brought us out here to die, Moses. We had it better. At least we had food there. Oh, it was better back then. But they forget very quickly how, number one, you're lost back there. You're a slave. Number two, you have no freedom, no liberty, no joy, nothing back there. I see people that their lives are messed up. Their marriages are messed up. They're going through divorce. They're facing situations in their lives that they can't handle. That's a lot of times what brings them to the cross. And they're crying out to God, help me, help me, help me. And God helps them. And, man, God starts putting their life together. They start the journey, and they hit a few uh, bumps along the way, which are discipline bumps, training, training obstacles, I'll call them. Back. Oh, I had it better back there. Did you really? Hello? Did you really have it better back in the world when you were a sinner? When you were lost and your life was messed up and you were on your way to hell? It's, you might get a little thirsty here. You might have, be going through something, but you know you're going to heaven. It's like this whole, all this stuff is going on right now. If you, you know, I've got friends that are sick. With the, I've got four or five pastor friends that are sick with the COVID, and, but you know what? They're not stressing. They're like, hey, pray for me, but I'm, I, there's, I have peace in it. I'll die today. I know where I'm going. That's perfect peace, and it all happened at the cross. So uh, visit Calvary. Spend some time gazing upon God uh, at, at, in flesh with our sins written in blood across his wounded body. Consider what God did for you. Uh, the cross can set us free from sin, the cross can set us free from pride and bitterness, from disappointment. The cross can set you free from failure, from anger, from depression, from anxiety, from doubt. It's all, somebody say freedom. The cross makes the bitter waters of life sweet. <laughs> Just like the tree was the first sign of God. It starts at the cross. You can't live for God without going to the cross. You can't live for the Lord without the sign of God's grace. A couple of 16, two, it's Moses and Aaron. Before it was just a few people. Now everyone, not just several. So now it's the whole congregation. Why? Because grumbling is contagious. It's dangerous. It's, it sets us up to, be, to never be happy. If you start looking for things to be unhappy with in life, you'll never be in short supply. If you're looking for a reason to mumble and complain, if you're looking for reasons to be unhappy, you'll never be in short supply. There's plenty of things in this world, in life. There's plenty of things in your marriage, folks, for you to be unhappy about. There's plenty of things at your job for you to be unhappy about. If you're looking for things to gripe about, you'll find plenty of them. Somebody said amen right there because that was good stuff. They grumble, they complain, then they start to exaggerate. Let's read that. You ever notice that? You start exact things look worse than they really are. Anybody ever look, think about that? Stop for right here. Just think about it. What was your last big crisis in your life? You're on this side of it now. Now look back. It don't look so big from this side. <laughs> but when you're in the middle of it, whew, boy, it looks huge. It looks huge. Exodus 16, verse 3, uh, they exaggerate. Let's read it. Would... Would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in Egypt, where, where we sat by meat pots and ate bread in full, for you have brought us here out here to kill us, kill the whole assembly with hunger. I think that's a different version there, but they're, they're exaggerating. Oh, man, we had plenty to eat, man. We had meat. We had plenty of bread. Well, they were living on leeks and garlic. They were about starved to death in Egypt. They were just getting enough to survive on, but now they're like, oh, it was good, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Now, they've been wandering in the wilderness, in the desert, and it's understandable. They're probably hallucinating. But it's, it's again, it's wrong how they reacted because now they have a choice. Remember? Now they're beyond the Red Sea. Now they're not slaves. They have a choice. They choose their attitude. They get to choose what they say. What They're no longer slaves. But notice something about them. They're still slaves in their minds, Brother Eric. They're still slaves. That's what happens to many of us. We come out of our walk, we come out of the world. God gives us, we get the we repent. God fills us with the Holy Ghost. We're baptized. We're set free. We're liberated from the from the uh, the hold or the snare of the devil. 
but he still influences our lives because he's still talking junk, and we're still believing it because he's still our, in our minds, he's still our slave master. I'm still addicted to this, or I still have this. Well, no, you're not. Jesus, if it, the, the scripture says, he whom the, the Son hath set free is what? Free indeed. So we're free. The fight now is between me and my flesh. The fight now is not me and the devil. The devil cannot make a Holy Ghost filled person do nothing. It's me and my flesh. Some may say he's talking to me. There you go. Hmm. Who was that? Okay, I hit the button by accident. So now again, it's, it's wrong. He didn't bring fire down on them. But the Bible says, again, he provides a solution. Verse 4, it says that, um, Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I am about to rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion. Notice he said, a day's portion. And I don't have it in my notes. Uh, Every day that I may test them. Hmm. Whether they will walk in my law or not. So he rain, literally rains bread from heaven. We know the story of manna. And it's tasty. It tastes like honey. It's delicious. But God does something a little different. He gives them a specific set of instructions on this manna that's raining down from heaven every day. He, he says, just get, gather just enough for today. Every day you get just enough for today. You, but on the sixth day, you gather twice as much so that on the Sabbath you can rest and you have provision for the Sabbath. And, of course, the human nature is what? Go get as much as you can. This stuff is good, man. Let's just get enough so I don't have to get an eye on him. Our walk, it's a, it's a learning process. Our entire life is he, his voice. So here God's, he gives them these specific instructions and he's teaching them to rely on on him. Sometimes God's one of God's greatest gifts can sometimes be our greatest tests. I have I've I've tried to have this motto most of my life as I've lived with God is is that um, God well we know the scripture teaches us that God will not let us go through anything that that we can't handle. And that's paraphrase. If you're trying to live for God, you're being faithful as you know how and you're going through a a huge test then God trusts you with that. You know why some people don't go through a lot of stuff? This is my theory. It's because God can't trust them with it. God only puts pressure on people that he knows can handle it. They don't, it doesn't take a whole lot to make that. But if you want a high carat, very valuable diamond, it's been through some stuff. Pressure. Heat, because, and it's become out a lot more valuable and effective when you slide it on that girl's finger. It worked out so good. But God, I, I believe that God puts, lets people go through stuff based on how, what he knows he can trust them with. Okay? Uh, so some of our, God's greatest gift to you is the test that you're going to face, the crisis that you're going to face. Because what happens in those crises? You learn to trust him. You get to see him work. What happens when you're going through this? And when you come out on the other side, you're a lot more valuable to the kingdom of God. You're a lot stronger. You've got a greater faith. Amen, Sister Fritchie. This is good for you this morning, isn't it? Amen. You're, you know why you're going through this? Because God knows he can trust you with it. You know why some people can't, couldn't even, did be done, walked out on God by now. Said, oh, God, he's not healing my husband, I'm done. But God knows. Okay. Uh, he'll, he'll give us something just to see what we can do, what, what we will do with it. Sometimes God will let you go through some stuff to test you. We know the story of Job. Sometimes God's going to put you through some stuff to test you. But it doesn't mean he's not, he hasn't left you. He hasn't forsaken us. He's just disciplining us. We want to be disciples of Christ. It takes discipline. And sometimes God is testing us. He's strengthening us. And he's trying to uh, see what we will do. with. It. Will we murmur and complain? Will we sin? Will we turn our backs on him? 
or will we be faithful? What are you going to do with what he gave you? What do blessings look like? What does a blessing look like? Real quick, somebody, what does a blessing look like? Good health, financial blessings. What else? What does a blessing look like? Huh? Protection. What? Avoiding a, 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 a crisis. Oh, over here, freedom. What's a blessing look like? Yeah. Waking up. What about sickness? Is sickness a blessing? Is crisis a, a blessing? What about a blown out tire or a, I would say that if anything that comes, that scripture, anything that happens or comes through to a, is a blessing of God because God is going, what's the scripture? What does Romans 8, 28 say? All things work together for what? The good. You know, every blessing that we named was a good thing, food, protection, but everything, even crisis, Bad situation, what we'd call a bad situation, is a blessing to a child of God because it's going to God's going to work it out for our good. We're going to be, He's going to build our character. He's going to build our faith. He's going to bless someone else through that. He's going to bring a lost person to, to, to the cross through our situation. So everything is a blessing. It's just a, our perception of it. What are we going to do? with the things, that, the blessings God gives us, they may look like hell on earth. But they very well may be blessings in disguise. Amen. Now, just like the tree was symbolic of something to come, so too is bread, the manna from heaven. The bread represents Jesus. The manna in the Old, in Old Testament represents Jesus in the New Testament. John 6, 32 then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Then said, then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, I am. I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never, what? Thirst. So Jesus is the bread of life. It means that I have to partake of him every day. It means that he, he's my nourishment for my soul. Jesus Christ is exactly what I need every day. And I can't live on yesterday's blessings. I can't live on my yesterday Jesus. I have to have new bread today. Amen. This, this world is famished for something substantial. I preached a couple of weeks ago on the word, the importance of the word of God. The rock Amen. Jesus Christ is the bread of life. He's the sustainer. We cannot make it without the bread of life. Amen. Constantly, uh, this world is constantly craving and consuming, but never satisfied. Uh, uh, the entertainment, or whatever. But Jesus is the bread that satisfies. Every day I must eat. How do we do that? John chapter 1, verse 1, we know the bread is Jesus, and Jesus is the Word of God. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. Verse 16 says, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. I eat the bread of life when I read the Word of God. This is, this is Jesus Christ right here. It's His Word. This is the bread of life. This is what gives me nourishment. This is what makes me, keeps me healthy. Amen. I can't make it without this. I preached that sermon two weeks ago. I'll leave that alone. I can't just read it now and then. I've got to eat it every day. I can't tell you, well, yesterday's will sustain me today. If you don't read the Word of God, you're going to be that malnourished. You're going to be sickly, and you're going to catch all kind of spiritual bugs. Can I put it in, that, in those terminologies? You've got to be healthy, right? Eat healthy and exercise. Eat healthy and exercise. Amen. Exercise. Praising the Lord. Amen. Prayer. Eat healthy and exercise makes you healthy in, in the Lord. Amen. Read your Bible. So the tree symbolizes the cross. Every day I've got to visit the cross. The bread symbolizes the word. Every day I've got to read the word. And we're reading. Uh, hopefully you're doing that. Now, there's one more sign of God's grace. I have to hurry here. Oh, wow. 
that we're going to study, and that's found in Exodus 17. And I don't think I'm going to have time to finish this. Um, I'll tell you what, I'm going to let Brother Josh finish that. So we've got two of them. So we're going to stop right there, and I'll let him finish the next one next week. So we've got the cross of the tree that makes life sweet, the cross. And you've got the manna or the bread that represents Jesus Christ and our, our, our sustaining life, our health. And then next week, we'll let him give you the third. We'll let, I'll leave you in suspense until next time. It's good, I promise you. Amen. Let's all stand. Give the Lord a good hand clap. Thank you, Jesus. How many of you expecting God to do something awesome today?